he said, I've got this motorbike, I've got a sidecar, let's go to New Zealand in it. Um, so we collected our gear and he decided to, he had no money whatsoever and I had to give him 50 pounds and took 50 pounds myself and we caught the train down to uh, Dover, got the ferry to Calais and started hitchhiking. We spent most of our nights in churches, farmyards, haystacks, but we did, we did get to um, Paris and we stayed in a youth hostel for about a week in Paris. Then we uh, hitchhiked down to Nice, which is on the coast. Then we hitchhiked from Nice straight across northern Italy um, and into Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was communist at that time, a military controlled place. Uh, and I can remember one night we s tried to sleep in the railway station at Zagreb and the army came and turfed us out and we had to walk out of town to find somewhere to sleep. I, and also, of course, getting into Yugoslavia, we'd come across the border and there was a man with a shed sitting there and we wanted to go that way and we were miming that's where we're going. No way, you go that way. And you had to book in, in the town that way, with your passports and whatnot. Which we had to do in the end because he got his rifle out and persuaded us. Um, anyway, so we went that way. And then from there, came back again and went where, where we were going. The boat, which only cost again a matter of shillings, you went what's called deck cargo. So you sat on the deck with 10,000 other Indians and you had this space and that was it. You fed yourself in that space, you didn't do anything else unpleasant in that space, um, but you stayed in that space because if you moved, somebody else would take that space. Anyway, that was a 24 hour trip from Karachi down to Bombay. So they had on this boat, they had, if I remember correctly, reasonably proper toilets, but the washing facilities was just one tap and everybody and their dog went to the tap. And what they used to do is they had a, a baked beans tin or some tin with holes in the bottom. You filled it, you got the tin as full as you could and you held it over your head and washed yourself as it came, came down. But I mean, we didn't have one of those. But the blokes loaned us one and you know, we got washed perfectly adequately. But one bloke quite close to us gave us a banana. And as far as I can remember, that's all we had. Um, Granville and I decided we would get a boat from Singapore down to Fremantle in Australia. Um, but that was a two week trip and they wouldn't let you go with one banana on the deck. Uh, you had to pay for meals. It was actually a cattle boat which carried cattle on board. Um, anyway, we eventually got on. There were quite a few other people and I think that's when we met up with that Australian bloke. He was also, we were in a cabin that had eight bunks in it. We were fed three times a day, which was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, I must have tripled my weight in that time. Anyway, it was gorgeous food. And we stopped in Northern Australia. And we pulled into a place that had a um, jetty that went miles out into the ocean. And that's where the boat stopped. And they unloaded the uh, cattle there. And they all went. But of course, uh, what's hardly interesting to us, the um, cattle men were all Aborigines, all sitting on the side of the deck where there's a bit of a rail, exactly like you see them sitting on rails in ranch situations now, 
a dozen of them with their hats slouched over their heads, all Aborigines, all there to take these cattle back into wherever they were going. So I, one evening I started walking out of Melbourne and I was totally shot. I came up to these shops, a street of shops, and I was thinking I can't really go any further. But there was a truck stopped outside one, and the truck he was in the shop buying something. So when he came out, I pleaded my case and asked him if he could give me a lift, which he very, very kindly did. And he, he must have taken me all the way to Sydney, I think, which again was a more than one day trip. Because um, I remember we stopped for lunch one place and I said, no, I haven't got any money, I can't, I can't come in with you. And he I paid for my lunch. Again, steak, chips and typical Australian lunch meal, you know. Um, so he paid for that, I remember vividly that, very nice job. Anyway, I'm pretty sure he took me all the way to Sydney and dropped me. And when I got to Sydney, I uh, again found the bank, got me money and went to the Salvation Army Hostel and spent three nights there, I'm nearly there, um, just wandering around time, town, eating cream cakes mainly. Uh, which, of course, I don't know if you... In those days, the cream cakes you got in Sydney were fabulous. Anyway, I got to Sydney, spent my time mooching around Sydney and booked a fare on the Wanganella. There were two ships that went from Sydney to New Zealand regularly, went to and fro, to and fro. The Wanganella was one of them. Once again, though, you, you paid a fee and everything was included, the meals as well, everything. But again, I was in a cabin with four other blokes um, and got on the boat. It was a beautiful boat. I had a great time. I got into Auckland and I we came to the usual docks in Auckland. I walked out of town, which was nowhere near as big in those days, and got lifts. I got a lift till the evening, I don't know where the hell I was, but they must have been replacing the sewerage pipes along the road, and those great big sewerage pipes. And it was July, so it was cold, and it was pouring with rain. And he dropped me off, and I crawled into one of those sewerage pipes and spent the night, first night, in New Zealand. 